So my friend Patrick Landry sent me this. It's a French invention by an inventor called Jean-Christophe Dumas. It's a resonant boiler and it's supposed to be super efficient. What it is really is uh, three hemispheres. You weld two of them together, you pop the other one on top, connect one to plus, one to minus, drop it in some water, and when you turn on an ordinary household supply, it's supposed to resonate the water at 50 hertz and boil it somewhat rapidly. It's a very interesting idea and well worth a look at, but alongside all of these things, of course, is the immediate desire to slap a patent on it, which Jean Dumas did. The patent was filed with the European Patent Office, so the original patent is in French, but there's an English translation available for you. So the English translation of that French patent is really quite easy to get. The device is really interesting and could well be replicated by anybody with enough desire to do it. And in Jean Dumas' defence, and actually I'm quite proud of him to be honest, although he's got the patent, he refuses to sell it and has left it open source. And that is a brilliant idea. I love that idea and I think all the best to the man. What a great thing to have done because of course these things don't exist in isolation. Nothing exists in isolation. So I don't want to take it away from Mr. Dumas' uh, invention, which I think is a great invention. But do you remember Peter Davy? Peter Davy was a 90-year-old New Zealander. And what he came up with, and it was reported widely on the news at the time, was something that looked suspiciously like Mr. Dumas' invention. And if you look at it, it is a couple of hemispheres that dropped in water, a household current that boils the water extraordinarily quickly. Mr. Davy has uh, since died. His family took completely the opposite tack than Mr. Dumas. They're holding on to that patent and won't tell anybody what to do despite the fact that the chap has died. They're hoping to be millionaires from this wonderful invention. And of course, uh, what happens with such things is exactly what happens with such things. Somebody else has come up with it. If you search a little further, you'll find that there has been a replication attempt using cones, two cones inside of each other, and that has a similar effect. If you're looking around at the Dumas effect and you dig into Keelinet, and Keelinet is a repository of all things free energy, you'll come across a guy called George Wiseman. Now, George reckoned he discovered this Dumas effect years before Dumas actually discovered it when he was doing HHO experimentation and he used flat plates. So we've got spheres working, cones working, flat plates working. None of it seems to matter that much on the geometry of the thing. It's another interesting thing that you think about. it When people were talking about this, they're talking about a, a strange resonant effect. To be honest, it's extremely unlikely that the household um, supply, which is at 50 or 60 hertz, is going to be the same as the resonance of water. And there's a broad band between 50 and 60, so it's pretty unlikely, I would say, that it's got anything to do with resonance. Now, this basic idea has been taken up by a company called Heatworks, and what they did was put a whole load of graphite plates together in a row that they're calling their ohmic array. And oddly enough, those flat graphite plates behave almost identically to Dumas' machine, Davies' machine, Wiseman's machine. It seems to have very little to do with resonance. It's got more to do with some very simple stuff. When you take a water heater and you stick it in some water, what you do is you heat up the heater on the inside. Inside that heater coil, it's... Um, Basically, a coil of resistance wire stuffed with some mag magnesium oxide surrounded with a copper jacket. That heat's got to get out there, and then it's got to heat the water around it. And of course, the first bit that it heats is the water that's touching it, and it boils that water off, leaving a deposit of minerals that are in the water. Now, one millimetre of scale will reduce the efficiency of an electric water heater to something like 50%. And you've got a heat up and a cool down time as well, because remember, the resistance wire is buried in some magnesium oxide. With the ohmic array, that effect is instant. And you're only hitting the bit that you want to hit, and you're not actually boiling it in the same way that you are with an electric heater. So it turns out it behaves in the same style, the same way as all of these special geometry resonant heaters. Now, you've got to ask yourself, well, OK, if these heaters are so good, why isn't everybody adopting them? And everybody isn't adopting them for the same reasons that everybody doesn't adopt stuff. 
it's a pain in the neck. It requires you to do something and it's a bit more costly up front because ohmic heaters can be recovered in five years and the water saving, water heating saving that will make. But you have to install them. You have to get somebody in to rewire them. And of course, people just don't do that. They stay with the old thing. And then when they replace it, they replace a bit like for like. It's called legacy. It's a legacy effect. So with the legacy effect, you don't get mass adoption. And Heatworks is having a uphill struggle to take their ohmic array out there in the market, even though it's product ready. Now, I point this out, really, because um, it is an extraordinarily interesting technology. It certainly works. It's questionable whether it works because of the geometry and the resonance that actually looks like it has um, no, no real significance whatsoever. The material matters. Wiseman found that when he used copper, all of the water got dirty and full of copper, so not particularly ideal. If you look to the Dumai device, you'll notice it was rusting. What heat works are doing are graphite plates. So what I've done is I've taken those flat plates of graphite and I've drilled them out to take a uh, lug. I've cut them apart so they don't interfere with each other and I've put a lead and I've made two just like that. So there's my two plates, and they go like that, so they don't interfere with each other. Now I'm going to hold them apart four millimetres, I'll put a bit of uh, hot glue in there just to hold them apart, and we're going to drop them in some deionized water, because this is deionized water, so we'll drop them in there. Now I have no intention of connecting this straight to the main. What I've got here is a variac, and a variac will trip out if this is short, if this short. So it'll trip out and save my main, and I've got a reset button on the variac. So having this variac that I can set to different voltages uh, and gives me an isolation from the actual main. So I'm going to put it through the variac and we're going to run it at about 100, uh, 100 uh, volts. I've also got a temperature reader here. It's a K-type thermocouple, so I won't be dropping it in the water. I'm going to put it on the outside of the glass so we can measure the temperature increase on the outside. It won't tell us what the water's doing, but if we get it to boil, we should see it boil. So let's set that up and then have a close-up of the experiment as it actually runs. There we go. It does in fact work. It boiled the water. I used uh, hot glue between the two plates just to hold them apart and the glue melted and shorted it out. But before that, obviously, it was boiling merrily away. So there we go. You, you don't need weird geometries to get this to work. You don't need hemispheres and they don't need to be exactly fitting. All you really need is a couple of plates held two to three millimetres apart, plug it in, and it becomes a water heater. And you can see, yeah, I mean, this is reading the temperature on the outside of the glass, and it's not particularly accurate, but you can see the steam coming off. You can actually feel how much heat it is, and we saw the temperature climb, and we saw the water boil. So that will do just fine. You get those from Amazon, but it did make me think two things. One, I perhaps ought to have more regard for men's electricity than I apparently do. And two, where could we get something that would do the same job, but be easily got? And what I came up with was these things. This is the rod from a zinc carbon battery. So you go out a zinc carbon battery with a pair of pliers and tim some tin snips and you'll get those out. You notice I've left the cap on and I've soldered a wire to the cap and of course I've got two of them. Then we have the problem of what we're going to do to hold them apart to stop it melting. And I've got a bit of tile, I've drilled some holes in it, 8 millimeters, which is how big those are. And my two rods will now nicely fit in that tile without touching each other all the way down and I can drop that in water. So that is my latest dumbass heater. And now, of course, we're going to put this in the men's. And invariably, when you do something like that, you get a cadre of health and safety sallies who go, don't do that, it's electricity. You can do this stuff just gym dandy as long as you're careful. Don't approach it wearing a suit of armour, standing in a pool of your own pee, holding on to the live wires. You'll be extremely sorry.
if you do that. But every time you plug something in and out, of course, you're handling men's electricity. And you follow the same rules. Don't touch the bare wires. Make sure you're nicely isolated from it and try to be some distance away. Use a safety switch if you really want to. We, of course, used a um, Variac in the previous one and then we flipped the fuse in the Variac so I'm going to have to reset the Variac fuse but we used isolation so we isolated it from the mains and you might have noticed I wasn't anywhere near it while I was testing it and that's because I didn't want to electrocute myself so use the same standard precautions and you're going to be fine don't use them and you're going to be mightily sorry anyway we're going to fill this up and we're going to fill it up with distilled water Plug it back into the Variac and see if we can get it to work. Okay, so set up in exactly the same way. There's my deionized water. The reason it's yellow is because the thermal sensor is taped on with Kapton. Reading the temperature, plugged into the Variac and leading straight into those two wires. One's live, one's neutral, going into those two caps there. Now, like I said before, approach this the same way you would your kettle. If you go to something like that, when it's turned on, yeah, that's going to hurt. So just steer clear of the thing, turn it on and give it a go and see what happens. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's start the experiment. So we're measuring the temperature on the outside of the glass, remember, and we can see the temperature on the outside going up. But what you can see if you look quite closely is between the rods, it's already beginning to steam and the steam is actually um, fogging up the top of the cylinder there and we can see it cooking away between the two rods. But then of course it's got to mix in what is essentially a massive volume of water because those two rods are about three centimeters into the water. Anyway, let's leave it a bit longer. That was awesome. Okay, so, oh, I hear that's hot. <laughs> okay, so, there's an alternative way of doing the dumbass experiment. You can use carbon rods out of a battery. Now, I wouldn't go drinking that water, okay, because it's come out of a battery, but um, it works. It took a little bit of time to get there, but then, like I say, we're using a couple of carbon rods, and those rods are about three centimeters in the water, and we have a big bulk of water, but that's certainly, yeah, that's hot. That certainly boiled it, so it certainly works. And if you wanted to do it with rods, you maybe you'd do it like an array or something like that to increase the surface area. Now, the, um, there does seem a tendency in people that when they discover something, they love it to be named after themselves. And this is a great example. We've got uh, the Duma effect, the Davy effect, the Wiseman effect, all of the same effect from people who have independently discovered this particular effect. And of course, uh, they haven't really discovered it. I mean, it's been pointed out that this is in fact just a stinger, which is exactly what it is. It's been used for a hundred years or something. I, I think it began in sort of World War II or so. So it's a very long def uh, uh, described effect that's been in existence and been known about for everybody who's been in prison and made their own hooch. It's an awfully well-known thing. The only thing that surprises me is that Dumas got a patent on it. But then the patent office is renowned for this sort of stuff. But people will argue that, no, it's not just this application of AC. It's the resonant frequency of water. Well, I hate to say this, but to my mind, that's extremely unlikely. Now, the idea of resonance is it's like pushing a swing. If you can get it to swing all by itself, of course, we know it takes very little push to keep that momentum of a swing going because the swing is in resonance. Now, the idea is that the water molecule will be switched and squeezed and stretched and squeezed in resonance and so it vibrates and like glass will break itself apart. So that's the essence of this resonant idea and the Duba effect is supposed to contain that. It's not just a stinger. It's specific to the shape, and so we get resonance set up. Now, that may or may not be so, but the resonant frequency of water is somewhere around about 22 gigahertz. It's actually a bit more than that. Whereas, of course, the frequency we're applying is 50 to 60 hertz. So, to my mind, it's extremely unlikely that a resonant effect is actually having anything to do with it at all. Now, there is a commercial product based on this that's been... Um, developed by a company called Heatworks. 
If you put Heatworks Omic Heater into your Google search bar, you'll find the company it comes up first and they have a ton of information on the stuff that they've been doing and they've been using flat graphite plates, which is exactly why we use flat graphite plates. And it's supposed to be an ohmic heater, which I can understand. It's an ohmic heater where the water is acting as the heating element rather than having a heating element. Heating elements have their own associated problems. You have to isolate them from the water because it's connected to the mains and has a plus and a negative. And of course you do that with magnesium oxide and a metal shell and that takes time to heat up and then you're boiling the water off the surface. So when the water boils off the surface, it deposits salts and you get limescale buildup. So all of that stuff is what goes on in a standard electric heater. The claim is with um, this ohmic heating where you're heating the water, because you're not heating on the surface of the plate, you don't get salt deposition. Because you don't get salt deposition, you don't get limescale buildup. Because you don't get limescale buildup, you don't get reductions in efficiency, and so the thing is much more efficient. Don't blame me, that's the claim. Look at Heatworks. A number of people have been suggesting that this is very strongly re related to the HHO cell, which it is. The difference is the HHO cell uses DC. When you're using DC, you're entering the world of electrolysis, which is exactly what the HHO cell does. It electrolyzes the water into hydrogen and oxygen. But electrolysis needs three things. It needs two plates, it needs an electrolyte, which is a conductive solution, and it needs a direct current. Now it's Michael Faraday who coined the term electrolysis, but it was Humphrey Davy who actually started to look at it and recognise the fact that chemical reactions involve the exchange of electrons. And of course a DC current is a flow of electrons as long as it has a path to flow along, which is why you need an electrolyte. An electrolyte is a conducting solution, it must conduct and so it contains salts. As that current flows from positive to negative, then the ions in the electrolyte are attracted to the opposite charged plates. So all the negative ions go to the positive plate, all the positive ions go to the negative plate. And if you perform electrolysis, like metal plating an object for instance, you'll see it's actually quite a slow process and you'll see the deposition of metal on one side and the release of the other material on the other side. And that's what electrolysis is. Now electrolysis, as I say, is in electrochemical terms, relatively slow. So if we apply DC to water, then the water will split into hydrogen and oxygen, and you can see that gas being released. That's electrolysis. When you use an alternate current, of course, what you're doing is you're swapping the plus and the minus. So like we say, we've got an ion sitting in there, a little positive ion. This side's negative, it's going to be attracted to it. Then we change it to this side negative and it goes that way. So all that happens is the ion moves a little bit backwards and forwards and the distance it moves is related to the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the more often you change the positive and minus, that little ion just jiggles around in between. The lower the frequency, the more distance it can move and so it can get to the plate, which is why you need DC. Now, of course, when you turn an alternate core on, for that 1 50th of a second, you have a plate which has a charge on it, and there is liquid touching that plate. So a very, very small amount of ions are sitting on that plate will be transformed into gas. Yeah. But it is a well-known phenomenon in flow batteries and in water electrolysis that when you first create the gas, the gas sticks to the plate. It's actually such a problem, you have to vibrate it to get the gas out and stop it from reducing the electrolysis because of course when the gas is on the surface there is no contact with the liquid and there is no electrolysis that goes on because there's no contact so you have to get the gas off and that actually takes a surprising amount of time. Now water itself contains dissolved gases so gas will dissolve in water and it will stick to the plate and it has one fiftieth of a second to become gas and then the plate reverses its current and the electron it just donated, it grabs straight back again and this gas becomes an ion. So although an almost insignificant amount of electrolysis will take place in alternating current, it is so insignificant and the gas has such a propensity to dissolve or stick to the plates, of the overall cell what you get is nothing at all. And so you don't get any electrolysis when what you're doing is applying an alternate current. 
So in a strict sense, you do right at the surface, but in an overall sense, you'll see nothing at all because it will reverse its polarity and anything that's been donated will be grabbed straight back off again. So electrolysis, in a broad sense, can't happen with AC. It only happens with DC. You must have that flow of electrons from one side to the other to separate the ions, give them time to give up or grab their extra electrons and deposit themselves. And it's a lot longer than one fiftieth of a second. If you reduce the frequency, of course you're going to get more electrolysis. We know that because all DC is, is AC at no frequency. So if we take it down to zero hertz, we get DC and we get electrolysis. If we take it up in frequency, then the amount of electrolysis that we get drops down quite remarkably until we get to a frequency where there is no overall electrolysis. As we increase the frequency, then there is less and less and less of this that happens. But that only happens at the surface of the plate. When you look at the cell and you apply AC, you will see no electrolysis and no gas being given off, however much you wish it to be. Now it also happens because remember water dissociates naturally into H plus OH minus. So even distilled water has a very, very, very low conductivity or an extremely high resistivity. But it does conduct a tiny, tiny bit in an absolute sense. But in a practical sense, no. So you can argue that electrolysis happens if you want, but it won't do you any good because you can't do anything with it. That's the problem. So just to reiterate quickly, the Dilma effect is down to ohmic heating, which is all by itself quite efficient because the water itself is the resistive element, or at least that's the claim. Resonance is extremely unlikely to play any part whatsoever because the natural resonance of water is 22 plus gigahertz and the frequency we're applying is 50 hertz. Electrolysis just won't happen as you look at it on the large scale. So there's no problem with hydrogen and oxygen evolution. Anyway, I hope that explains the Dilma effect. What I'm smiling at is I can just imagine the comments on this one where people are gonna go, oh no, it's just a water heater, don't bother. It is distinctly different to have a wire heating something and to have it directly heated all by itself. So uh, certainly that's what I find interesting about the technology because it leads to tankless heaters. If you wanna know more, do look up Heatworks. I'm not being paid by them to say this. I think it's really quite interesting and well worth a look at. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I do sincerely hope it helped with some of the comments. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.